Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to our second breakout session of the day. This is uh, How Windows Legislation Has Impacted Survivors by Jeff Herman. Uh, before I introduce and welcome Jeff, I would like to take an opportunity to thank those who have made this year's annual conference possible. First off, I would like to thank our corporate sponsors, Ribera Law Firm, Lamoth Law Firm, and MK Safety Net. In addition, we'd like to thank our longtime friend and supporter, Mitch Garabedian, who has been generous enough to support us with a $10,000 matching grant. Thanks to you folks, this convention is made possible. In addition, on behalf of SNAP, I'd like to welcome Jeff Herman to our 2021 annual conference. Jeff is a nationally recognized trial lawyer and advocate for survivors of rape, sexual abuse, and sexual exploitation. Over his career, he has represented 1,000 brave men, women, and children. And over the past two decades, Jeff has built a national practice and has become one of the nation's leading childhood sexual abuse lawyers and pioneers. He is, in essence, a true champion of clients' rights. Jeff is the founding and managing partner of Herman Law. Jeff, welcome, and thank you for sharing with us today. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and being able to, to, to talk about uh, my experiences uh, with the Child Victims Act. And, and um, it's certainly uh, been an important piece of legislation and has impacted uh, so many lives. And I wanna talk about um, the history, um, you know, when it started, my experiences in, in, in handling these cases so far and what I expect for the future and what I think uh, survivors uh, can expect uh, in their respective cases. And so I'm gonna share my screen and um, turn to the PowerPoint. So um, the first thing I wanna mention is, is really what my job is and, and what we do at Herman Law. We, we help victims heal by giving them a voice through civil litigation. Um, I mean, our job is to expose predators and, and provide a measure of justice. We understand that there is no magic wand and, and our role is a, a small role uh, in a person's journey for healing. But in my experience, it can be an important role. And that's because we know that by, by, by giving somebody a voice, and being able to process it and seek justice, that that experience in and of itself is often critical and helpful um, on that, that journey of healing. Healing is a journey, it's not a destination. No matter what we do, we can't take away what happened, um, but it, is, it can be a, an important milestone simply by having a voice and simply by being able to talk about what happened um, and seek justice. Ultimately, the only justice that we can seek is money. It's monetary damages. And I know that that money um, is really, it's really symbolic. In our measure, our, our system of justice only allows money. So that money becomes a symbol. Uh, having a settlement or having a verdict, uh, whatever that is, I believe, and I've seen this for survivors, it, it is a, a measure for them that yes, they're, they're being validated, they're being vindicated, something bad happened uh, and it's not their fault. And that's what's been so important about the Child Victims Act. So the history of course, is that um, for, for a very long time, um, there's been an awakening uh, about the nature of childhood sexual abuse and the need to reform and change the statute of limitations um, that in many cases were, were unfairly restrictive. And why is that? Well, 
The reality is, is that 90% of children that are abused are abused by somebody they know. It's not the stranger. You know, we all grew up hearing stranger danger. Of course, danger, strangers can be dangerous, but they're not statistically the real issue, the real problem in terms of the numbers of victims um, that are being molested. Because the perpetrator is somebody that the victim knows and trusts, they're typically groomed. Grooming is the process where the perpetrator is using all sorts of techniques to gain the trust of the victim and the victim's family so that ultimately they can be uh, they can sexually molest them. It typically doesn't start out as a sexual molestation. Typically, it's about um, attention. Um, it, it's the, the word grooming really is nothing more than seduction. When an adult is uh, interested in another adult, um, they, they date them. They try to seduce them as adults will do. When it's a child, it's called grooming, and of course that's inappropriate. But what these perpetrators are doing is they're trying to seduce the child with their own techniques. And because of that, the child victim, by the time they're being molested, are typically compliant, meaning they might be physically participating in the, in the sexual acts. Of course, they're not consenting, they're kids. But because they're compliant victims, it becomes very confusing. Victims blame themselves. They think they did something wrong. They're not going to be able to talk about it, which is why changing these laws on the statute of limitations was so important. And so uh, recently we know New York was the first state recently to change the laws. And I'm gonna share my experiences uh, with the uh, Child Victims Act in New York. Um, I mean, I do. there are still windows that are open in other states such as New Jersey and California, North Carolina. Um, uh, Louisiana, um, and hopefully we, we expect that other states will be opening up windows, um, which, which is so, so important for the survivors. Um, I mean, during the recent years, I have, I have about 3,000 cases now representing victims under Child Victims Acts. Um, I filed about 1,600 cases in New York. So, so I want to share what I've learned about these cases and, and in, terms of, in terms of the facts. So who are the perps? Well, I will tell you that um, most of the time, almost all the time, the perps are men. And I will tell you my experience um, when we're talking about pedophiles, and by pedophile, I'm talking about a, a person who is interested in sexually a prepubescent child. Of course, kids are molested anytime they're under, under the age of consent. But the pedophiles we see are typically men. Doesn't mean women don't, don't abuse. Um, I certainly do have cases where the perpetrators were women. Um, there's much less of them. But what I find is that when the women are molesting, for example, I have cases with nuns who are molesting young children. Those, um, in my experience, are acts of violence and control and power. Um, and not necessarily um, the same way a man molests a child um, who's a pedophile, strictly motivated by, by sexual gratification. Now, for me as the lawyer, it's important because then we know that in the, in the cases where there's females molesting, there might be warning signs about the, the, the way they're disciplining children. And often we see they're doing this in front of other, other adults, which of course, from a litigation standpoint is something we wanna to know to help us prove our case. And I'll get into liability um, a little later on. But, uh, but typically the perpetrators are men. Um, and of course, they're almost always men that the victim knows. Um, and in, in most, if not all cases, there's more than one victim, which is important because again, that's as the lawyers litigating the cases and looking for evidence um, we're looking for witnesses. We're looking for what we call notice witnesses. Um, but the perps generally um, are that we're finding are Catholic priests, Catholic brothers, um, uh, of course, Boy Scout leaders, teachers, 
um, a lot of foster care cases, a lot of foster fathers, um, and then staff working at these institutions where kids are being housed, whether they're reform, whether they're treatment, um, it's where there are vulnerable children. Um, and, and so who are the defendants? It won't surprise you um, that the defendants are the Catholic Church, um, our, our, our foster care agencies and, and counties, social service programs, uh, schools. Um, so I, in my numbers of the 3000 cases that I currently have, 30% um, are Catholic clergy, 30% are foster care cases, 15% our school cases. Um, and then from there, we're getting involved with uh, smaller percentages of uh, treatment centers, medical facilities, um, other places, camps, where, where we're going to find kids. You know, you just have to ask yourself the question, you know, where are our kids? That's where you're going to find the perpetrators. Why? Well, where do bank robbers go to find money? They go to banks, that's where the money is. So where are perpetrators gonna put themselves? They're going to put themselves where there are children. Um, and that's nothing new. We've known about that. Um, institutions have known about that for years. You know, one, one, one of the things that um, I find absurd in prosecuting these cases is the defense that I hear um, from many defendants um, uh, and, I've, and I've seen this from the Catholic Church a lot, where they're, they're acknowledging, oh yeah, there were kids that were molested, but you know, we know this now, things are different today, and it's not fair to apply today's rules to behavior going back decades ago. Um, well, I find that to be a bunch of excuse my language crap. Um, and how do we know that that's not true? Well, it was always wrong to molest children. It was always wrong. And we know they knew it was wrong because that's why they hid it. That's why they moved priests around. That's why um, they didn't tell the police because they knew they'd get in trouble. Um, it was never okay to molest children. It's never been okay. Um, and so what's different today is the ability to take action the ability to report it. Um, I see a lot of cases and, and where there's notice, um, meaning that there was a, 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 an adult woman, adult female at a Catholic school or at a, or at a public school or somewhere where they were aware that the child, a child was being molested. And they didn't do anything about it, and they didn't report it. And, and the question is why, you know? Well, I think that is something that was different um, potentially um, decades ago where women were not empowered. A nun who saw a child being molested uh, may try to report it, but was shut down. Um, and they weren't empowered to take action. And, had, and, and sometimes they, they, would, they would report it, but nothing would happen. Um, they were disempowered. Women were disempowered um, decades ago. Um, doesn't make it okay. Um, there certainly were plenty of people who reported it, um, and then they were they were nothing happened. But it doesn't protect these institutions, and it's not a good defense for them. They are still responsible. So th those are the the cases that that I have seen under the Child Victims Act. Um, of course, those aren't the only victims. Those aren't the only uh, people being molested. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of, of children who are molested by family members, um, incest cases, or individuals. Um, I'm talking about institutional cases because those are the cases that typically we're handling because we're doing these on a contingency fee, meaning we are only going to get paid um, at the end of the case by the institution. Um, and so... Um, as, as a business, we're not, we, we're not taking cases where we're not going to be able to collect money. But that doesn't mean other people weren't abused and they don't have the rights or didn't have the rights to bring claims because they certainly, certainly did. 
Um, and for many people, I think they hired their own lawyers and, and paid them to file civil lawsuits um, if they could um, and to seek justice. Um, but so there, that, that, that is one of the issues. Um, I think that's a, 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 a problem that we've encountered with the Child Victims Act is that there's a, there's a lot of publicity brought to victims having rights, but as a practical matter, um, many victims were not able to do anything because they don't have the money to hire a lawyer to do it. Um, and that, that's unfortunate. Um, the other thing I wanna mention issues with the Child Victims Act, in, in a lot of ways, it's a double-edged sword. And I've seen this many times with, with my clients. And that is that because they were unable to bring a claim, they've spent their lives trying to forget about what happened and trying to move on with their lives. Now, all of a sudden, by the, the stroke of a pen, this law is enacted and now victims have the right to bring their civil lawsuits. Um, and so everything they've been trying to forget, we're now asking them to think about. And even if they don't want to think about it, they're bombarded with news articles and TV advertisements and, and digital media ads. And they're, it's like, uh, if someone has PTSD, it is, it is, it is a trigger. Um, and so that has been an issue. Um, and, and so we have to be very sensitive. Um, and I mean, we, I mean, lawyers and, and people in my law firm and other people as well, of course, that we're dealing with a subject matter that in and of itself discussing, discussing <clears throat> is a trigger um, for many people who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And so the most important thing that we can do when we're talking to clients is to listen and to help them tell their story and be sensitive to the fact that this could be the first phone call that the first time they're ever talking about what happened. Even if it's not, it is a trigger because they're talking about being molested. And as they're talking about being molested, they are likely feeling the same sort of things they were feeling when they were being molested. That's what happens when kids are molested. And so it's very important and we spend a lot of time training our people um, to, to talk to survivors with a lot of sensitivity and to listen and go at their pace. Um, and and I, I think overall, I think we've been, been able to do that because I hear from clients all the time who, who are just feeling very grateful um, the way they've been treated and the way we hear them. Um, and so, that's, uh, that's important. And, and I start out this presentation talking about what we do, which is help victims heal. Um, and that's our number one priority. If we focus on that as lawyers, everything else will fall into place. The cases will fall in place. Our clients will be empowered. Our clients will be able to talk about it, <clears throat> be better witnesses. Um, we focus on healing because that's what it's about. And frankly, if we didn't focus on healing and all we focused were on the lawsuits, on the litigation, we couldn't do what we do because these are very, very, very um, difficult stories. Um, and we have to be able to be empathetic, meaning we understand it um, and not sympathetic. And the way we can be empathetic is to, is to um, empower our clients, empower ourselves to take action um, and to seek justice. So seeking justice, what does that mean um, under the CVA? Because just having the right to file a lawsuit <clears throat> doesn't mean you're going to win. We still have to prove our cases. Now, these cases are typically what we call negligence cases. A negligence case against an institution means that we have to prove that this institution knew or should have known that the perpetrator was unsafe and that there was a risk our client could be abused. In other words, um, just because somebody was abused by a staff member or an employee at an institution does not make that institution financially responsible in a civil case. In fact, the law says that Generally speaking, 
and in an organization is not legally responsible when a person commits a criminal act like sexual abuse. The exception to that is when there is a, a, a special relationship with the institution and the victim. So for example, a priest and a child um, or a, a, a parishioner, a, a school and a, and a student, a Boy Scout troop and, and the children, that, that that relationship creates a responsibility for the organization to protect the child from what's called foreseeable harm. So the exception to the rule that the organization is not legally responsible when a child is molested is when it is foreseeable that the child is in danger. So, so what makes it foreseeable? Well, what makes it foreseeable? Easy example is if, in, if I have a client who was abused by a priest in 1986, if there's a witness who reported that they were abused by that priest in 1985, then that makes it very foreseeable that, that all children in the future are in danger. And so that's what we call notice. And so we're looking for notice and, and being able to prove notice. Now, notice that a, a, a priest or a school teacher or a foster father molested a child is clear notice. There's also evidence sometimes that the institution should have known that they're what we call red flags. Uh, we have many cases, for example, where um, uh, a teacher is taking kids uh, alone into a room or taking them on trips or providing them with alcohol, having going to kids' homes. I mean, there's all these things that are red flags that if the organization knows about these red flags, puts them on notice that um, there is a risk. It's foreseeable that a child uh, could be hurt. And so again, these are important facts that ultimately we have to prove at trial to, to, to uh, win our case, to be successful. Um, I will tell you, uh, we have in-house, I have my own investigators, um, I actually have a dozen investigators who are all former detectives and cops that, that work in my firm. Um, and it's incredible the amount of notice that we've already discovered before we even file the cases. There was so much notice in these cases um, in all the cases I'm mentioning, we have so many foster care cases where these children, such vulnerable children, um, taken from their homes, put in a foster home, being molested by the foster father, and they report it to the social worker. And the social worker does nothing or just tells them, you know what, you just have to put up with it. You want me to put you back in your house or you want me to put you somewhere else? So it's going to be worse. Just really, really, really horrific stories where these, these children um, were vulnerable and, and, and taken advantage of. Um, um, and you can imagine, you know, what does that do? What does that do? And I know um, many of you know what it does um, in terms of damages. Um, often we see either post-traumatic stress disorder or symptoms of post-traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder. Um, but where there's a loss of trust um, where, where a child becomes very um, damaged psychologically in the way that they're, they're fearful. They're always waiting for the other shoe to drop and that they, they approach life with this fear. Um, and because many victims never talk about it or haven't talked about it yet, um, they've, they've tried to live with this fear themselves and to process it. Um, because of post-traumatic stress disorder, I mentioned in the beginning, there are what we call triggers, which are things that remind a victim that they were of the abuse. Um, it's just like um, a soldier going to war and every time a, a, um, a, a, a gun goes off or a bomb goes off, um, we go into survival mode. And that means our brain releases chemicals like adrenaline to prepare the body for the, uh, the oncoming trauma. Um, there are physiological changes that take place to prepare the body um, when the brain releases adrenaline. The mind races, and that so the person can deal with the trauma. Um, blood rushes to the vital organs, that so that if our arms are ripped off, we don't die. Uh, we sweat, so if we're grabbed, we slip away. These are all things that are 
caveman-like that our bodies developed um, to, to avoid trauma and danger. But the problem is um, that when that soldier comes home from war and he's driving down the road and a car backfires, sounds like a bomb, soldier knows it's not a bomb, but his brain has been trained to release that adrenaline and go into the survival mode. People call that anxiety attacks because now that person driving a car is feeling sweaty, their heart's pounding, their mind's racing, all those things they felt when the bomb went off, they're feeling while they're driving the car and that's not a good feeling. Same thing happens often with victims of sexual abuse. Something reminds them of the abuse, <clears throat> whether it's a conscious trigger, like telling their story to the lawyer or in court or to somebody, or they see someone who looks like their, their perpetrator or they're driving past the location where the uh, abuse took place or it looks like it or a smell or something they don't even know what it is and, but their mind remembers it at a, at a subconscious level and the brain releases adrenaline. And so now that person's having an anxiety attack. Well, many victims um, don't get help right away, aren't able to even talk about it. So they self-medicate because no one wants to feel that way. So they start doing drugs or drinking alcohol to make them feel better. And then um, that makes them depressed. And what do people do when they're depressed? Well, maybe they drink some more. So it's, 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 it really is a vicious cycle, which is why getting help now is an opportunity to begin healing in new ways. And that's why these, these Child Victims Act are so important. Thousands of people are getting help that weren't getting help before. Um, and then there's this collective empowerment. I mean, and no one knows better than SNAP about collective empowerment is because people feel alone. And people used to suffer in silence and suffer alone. But understanding that there's more victims out there um, is, so, is so important. Um, I have a group of cases uh, in, in New York, uh, in the Bronx, at a Catholic school uh, and church called Our Lady Mount Carmel. It's literally in, uh, literally in the Bronx. If you've ever seen um, A Bronx Tale, the, the church is actually in the movie, um, in one of the scenes. And this is the classic uh, old Italian town. As it turns out, um, the, the coach, janitor slash after school specialist guy who was always around, Rudy Tremoroli, was a rabid pedophile. And these boys, he was abusing boys from the 1970s up until he died in 1992. And he was being reported throughout that entire time period to the, to the principal of the school, to the uh, uh, pastor at the church, um, to multiple people who all protected him and kept it quiet. Um, but what was shocking is that so many of these victims before these cases were filed, thought they were the only ones and never talked about it and were living and suffering um, in silence. I represent 71 men now who were abused by Rudy Tremoroli um, throughout this time period. And it's incredible how many of them thought that they were alone. Um, and uh, in fact, the youngest victim who was horrifically abused in 1992 um, was one of the first ones to contact my office. Um, and he thought he was the only one. Um, and then he found out he's, of our clients, he's the 71st victim of the 70 we represent. Um, and so there is this collective empowerment um, and he is healing in ways he never thought he could heal. Um, and I hear from the, these victims and so many all the time. Um, one of the things that I do in my firm, we have weekly meetings um, in the firm um, and uh, with everybody um, because we have, um, we're, we have, I have staff and lawyers now in California, New Jersey, New York, and, and we're based in Florida, uh, certainly in Florida. Um, but we start the meetings with um, people sharing experiences of something our clients have said in, about how the case is helping them heal. And um, that's what it's all about. And that's how we keep everybody uh, focused on, on what, what, is, uh, what it's about and what's so important. Um, which brings me to you know, what to expect if you are a client, you're a plaintiff in a case under a CBA. Well, I think the first thing and the, uh, you, you should expect 
is to have communication with your law firm and with your lawyer. Um, we understand that these cases are different. And as I mentioned before, we're, we're dealing with uh, people who were molested by somebody they trust. So naturally, there's an issue of trust, right? Um, and the other thing, as I mentioned, is that the call in and of itself can be a trigger. So what I explain to my people in my firm is that we have to remember that when someone's calling us, it's a trigger for them. They, have may, they, they may be thinking about making the phone call and are waiting till they feel strong enough. And if they call us and we don't get back to them that day, they're going to feel betrayed. They're going to feel triggered. They're gonna have a loss of trust again. So we have a rule um, that when someone, anyone calls or emails, um, they must get a response that day. Even if the response is, hey, I can't get back to you today with a, with, to, to speak because I'm doing something, but we'll call you tomorrow. Um, I have people in my firm who are in charge of making sure that happens. Now, I'm not going to say it's perfect. There are times it slips through and then we deal with that and I have to get involved and talk to my apologize to the clients and, and also talk to my people because we don't want that happening. That's a big deal. Um, and so I think everyone has a right to have open and uh, and and uh, reasonably quick communication. And so you should get a call back that day. I have so many cases where people call me and say, oh, I'm not hearing from my lawyer and they're frustrated and, and they have a right to be. The other thing that's really important is honesty because not every case um, can be, is gonna be successful under the law. And I tell my clients as I tell them, just like I explained here today, how we prove the cases, what it means and what the law is, we have that discussion. And I say, look, we have to be able to prove this. And when you're honest with people, they appreciate that. That's what people want. And so in the, in the cases where we don't find notice, and I have to say, unfortunately, we cannot prove the case. And it's not going to be anyone's benefit for us to file a case for you to go through the process, and the case is going to be dismissed. Um, they want that honesty. Um, and I think they appreciate that honesty. And even though there was no recovery, the fact that they were heard and respected um, and we tried is often um, an important part of the healing process. And so um, th those are my experiences um, with, with so far what's happening. What's going to happen now in the future is, um, you know, we're moving these cases as quickly as we can to trial. Of course, COVID has been a huge roadblock um, and has slowed everything down. And defendants take advantage of that. Defendants are wired to delay, delay, delay. Uh, we know that. So what we do is we wanna be proactive. We wanna move the cases forward um, and get them to trial as quickly as possible. And that's the daily fight we go through. Move the cases forward, move them forward. <clears throat> Under the New York Child's Victims Act, the law um, put made these cases priority. Um, and the idea was that they would be resolved um, or getting discovery be completed within a year. Obviously that didn't happen. Uh, COVID was, was an easy excuse, um, but uh, we're still fighting against that. And I think over the next <clears throat> year and a half, cases will all be going, getting to trial and um, that will be um, a big shift. Um, and, and, and be able to finally get some sort of resolution. It's taken too long. I've had clients who, who were elderly and passed away. Um, there's many cases, um, there's cases, I don't say many, but there's certainly cases we've already settled um, at a discount because the clients were elderly and didn't want to wait um, any longer. And that's certainly, that's their case and it's their right. The clients make the decision. Um, and so, um, but for the typical case where um, we're, not being artificially rushed um, by a particular deadline, we will move them to trial because that's the best way to get a fair result and to get the fair number um, for these cases. Most of them will settle, but I don't think we get the fair value, the fair number, what I think is the cases should settle at until we are literally going to trial and they're forced, the defendants, to deal with it. Um, it has been an incredibly, uh, incredible experience for me um, to represent thousands of victims in these cases. 
Um, and uh, I appreciate it. And I feel very blessed to be able to do these cases. I've been doing them since 1997. I've learned a lot. Um, and I feel like I know now, um, you know, what, what, what the roadmap is and, and how we can best help our clients. And that's very satisfying. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions um, now. And uh, uh, my email's up here, uh, jherman or hermanlaw.com, or you can always find me at hermanlaw.com. Very easy, um, but I'm happy to, uh, to answer anything. Jeff, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your uh, excellent presentation uh, and for sharing your expertise and equally, if not more importantly, your compassion for survivors and their families. The first question comes from Bobby. Uh, he asks, what are the implications of the newly formed Sexual Abuse Task Force in the Southern Baptist Convention for Civil Litigation? Do any of these seven task force members seem like allies of survivor litigants? Well, I'm not I'm not familiar with with the task forces. Are these are these a task force that was created by the Baptist Church, or these are survivor groups? I'm not familiar. Um, can we get clarification? Uh, created well, by the church. Okay. Yes. So. <laughs> I would be very suspect. Um, in my experience, um, oftentimes there are people who want to do good uh, with the institutions, but these are the defendants who are creating, if they're creating these task forces, which I understand is happening here. In my experience, they're used um, to showcase and, and some things that the church is trying to do, but in reality, they hurt defendants' cases. They hurt plaintiffs' cases. Um, statements will be taken, uh, then used against the victims. Um, and um, I just think that um, anytime there's there, the defendants involved in trying to help the victim, um, this is what lawyers are for. Um, and the lawyers should be the ones helping their clients because the lawyers have loyalty to their clients. The church and these task force, their loyalty is going to be to the church. Great, thank you. Jeanette has uh, this question. Has the Catholic Church come up with any relatively new quote unquote dirty tricks uh, to stonewall prosecution and avoid their declared guilt? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, daily they're coming up with, with, with new stall tactics. Um, and, but this is, you know, we, we see this with all defendants, um, but, but certainly with the Catholic Church, um, they'll use any opportunity to delay. Um, I mean, I've seen this where uh, we're taking a deposition of, uh, of, of a witness, um, an important witness in the case who's elderly and sick. And so the defendants file the church an emergency motion that they want the court to rule he's incompetent because he's sick. Um, and of course, under certain rules, it automatically stops the deposition and now the court has to intervene. I mean, what makes sense is to finish the deposition, it's being recorded, then the court can make a determination. Um, and the defendant knows that, uh, but the defendant didn't, since it's a former principal of a Catholic school, the defendants weren't, the church wasn't sure how they wanted to handle this. Once you started testifying and saying things that were gonna hurt them, um, it became an issue for them. Um, but yeah, so, so, but delaying discovery. The other thing they do under, under New York law, um, the defendants have the right to take the plaintiff's deposition before we as the plaintiff's lawyers can take depositions of the defendants. So what they do is they just don't set those depositions and they stall it out. Now, there's ways to counter that. What we do is we, we're giving them dates to take our client's deposition. And then with, when they don't, we, we, we argue they've waived it, but it's a delay tactic and it just slows everything down. Um, it, it, I, don't think the, I guess there's nothing new, but it's just more of the same. 
And um, here's another question uh, that has come our way. Um, the individual indicated that the hardest thing was not having access to the records after I won the suit. I would love to expose him, uh, the perpetrator, with proof in public media. Why are those records kept confidential? Well, I don't think they should be, and I'm not sure which records, but if there are, if these are, let's say it's a church file, um, there are those records um, about the church's notice and about the priest or whoever molesting other children reports, they can be redacted, meaning if there's other, of course, other victims' names, their privacy should be protected, but those files should be public. I think the, the public has, has, a, has a right to know, and I think there's an obligation for us to, to publicly produce those documents. Now, the case is settled oftentimes, and this is, you know, this, this whole thing with the IRCP, uh, the reconciliation program that the church um, in New York and in other places put together, the, the part of the, the process was to keep records confidential. It was a one-way street. So a, a, a victim would submit to, the, to this process. They'd have to tell their story. They'd give up records. The church would give up no records. The church would make a, make a you know, discounted settlement, pennies on the dollar, and then keep everything confidential. That's a huge problem with the program. That's why I've been so against that from the beginning. Um, but um, that's, that's you know, something, if it's, it's already confidential, um, and if it's, an, the only thing I would say to this person who asked the question, if they've already settled their case, and the records were kept confidential as part of that case, it's possible that there's other victims and other cases pending, and they can contact the lawyer representing those victims um, and try to and get the records that way. Great, thank you, Jeff. And uh, another question that we have uh, here is a simple one. Uh, in, your, in your presentation, you mentioned the name of a movie uh, Carlotta would like to know what the name of that movie was. It's a, a Bronx Tale. So okay. a Bronx Tale is a famous mafia movie. Um, and, but it's literally a scene in, it's Arthur Avenue, New York, which is a famous, famous street, uh, Italian street. And the movie takes place there. And, and um, the, the character in the movie starts off by saying, this is, this is my neighborhood, um, and this is my church, Our Lady. And they, they talk about the church in the movie. And, and yeah, it's a Catholic, uh, Italian Catholic community that, where these kids were victimized. Um, and then one final question uh, before we, we end uh, the session. And uh, here it is. Um, what are your views on victims participating with SNAP support groups? I have many callers, survivors, whose attorneys advise against being in a SNAP support group. I understand in talking about the details of their case, but it seems an attorney would want uh, to hear their client to be supported and more able to get through the tough cases. Yeah, my opinion, as I started out in the very beginning, the most important thing that we focus on is helping victims heal. Anything that helps people heal is the priority. Um, I see no downside. I only see upside to being in support groups, to doing anything a person needs um, to help them. Um, that's what this is about. We're not helping anybody if we're, if we're not completely supportive of the healing process, I don't see how that even could even hurt a case, frankly. I would love to see a defense raise the fact that my client was in a support group as somehow that, that would hurt, hurt their case. Um, so yeah, no, I, I completely disagree with um, restricting any of that. Uh, and I believe that is the most important thing we do is to get our clients help um, and to help however way we can to help them heal. Great. Uh, again, thank you, Jeff. Um, 
that was the last of our questions. Uh, and I remind folks that uh, we have coming up uh, at 3.30 uh, uh, Eastern time today, our final breakout session with Mary Dispenza on um, healing the hurt through arts. Jeff, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, your time and your energy uh, for sharing what you have with our, with our participants.